Hey, 42 here. If you spent any time in the cinema recently, you may have noticed that Hollywood has a habit of glamorizing pretty much every profession it touches. For example, I'm confident that very few archaeologists have ever recovered priceless treasure raiding tombs. You'd have to be incredibly handy with LinkedIn to find a Harvard professor with a focus crisscrossing the globe thwarting the efforts of ancient secret societies. And your average hacker is more likely to be sitting in their parents' basement searching for COD exploits rather than taking down the FBI from their swanky penthouse apartment. Another commonly misrepresented job is that of the assassin. These guys crop up so often in TV, film, and computer games, you'd be forgiven for thinking assassinations a booming industry and a fantastic career choice. There's Jason Bourne, Agent 47, Deadpool, Leon the Professional, John Wick, and that annoying guy from Game of Thrones who always refers to himself in the third person, to name just a few. But a quick look at your favorite internet job board will soon show you that assassination gigs are actually pretty thin on the ground at the moment. But for whatever reason, humanity remains morbidly fascinated with the idea of a deadly assassin emerging from the shadows to delete some random, unsuspecting VIP with extreme prejudice. Assassination, in one form or another, has been around for as long as there have been humans. But the modern interpretation of the master assassin, a skilled, stealthy killer who murders innocent people for religious or political reasons, can be traced back in time almost 1,000 years to a historical faction called the Order of Assassins. Led by a mysterious individual known to outsiders as the Old Man of the Mountain, the Order of Assassins became famous for eliminating some of the most powerful people on the planet with apparent ease. They operated in the Middle East between the 11th and 13th centuries, during which time they were responsible for literally hundreds of high-profile assassinations. They became so synonymous with the concept of killing for political reasons that they're the reason we call it assassination in the first place, but more on that later in the video. If you're a gamer, you may know that the Assassin's Creed franchise borrows heavily from the Order of Assassins, but the real organization was very different to the fictional one. The real Assassins weren't some kind of global peacekeeping force seeking to improve the lot of mankind one high-profile murder at a time. They were simply a group of like-minded individuals doing what they needed to do to survive in a hostile world. It just so happens that what they needed to do to survive was murder a lot of very important people. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In the early days, the group we now call the Order of Assassins, that came much later, weren't killers at all. They were deeply religious members of a brand new branch of Islam that formed in the late 11th century after a succession crisis in the Fatimid Caliphate, a powerful Ismaili Shia Muslim dynasty that ruled much of North Africa and the Middle East around the turn of the second millennium. The seat of the Caliphate's power was in Egypt, and it was in Cairo that the succession crisis took place between two of the Caliphate's princes. The eldest of the two princes, Nizar, was passed over for rule in favour of his younger brother, Al-Mustali. After a brief power struggle, Prince Nizar was executed and his followers were forced to flee east into Persia in modern-day Iran. There, they founded a new branch of Shia Islam called Nizari Ismailism under the guidance of a charismatic missionary by the name of Hassan e Sabah. But life wasn't easy for the followers of this new doctrine. At the time, Persia was occupied by the powerful Seljuk Empire. As Sunni Muslims, the Seljuks considered Nizari beliefs to be heretical, a view that was also shared by the country's Shia minority. But Hassan was a devoted and capable missionary, and he spent years traveling Persia, discreetly spreading the word of Nizari Ismailism and attracting new followers to the cause. The trouble was, he was almost too good 
His activities eventually attracted the attention of the ruling Seljuks, and a warrant was issued for his arrest. Hassan was forced into hiding in the mountains in the north of Persia, but he didn't stay there for long. He was also aware that his ability to gain more followers would be somewhat hampered if he spent the rest of his life living in a cave. So he set about searching for a new base of operations from which he could safely grow his fledgling religious order. Soon enough, he found just the place. Alamut Castle was an imposing mountain fortress in northern Persia, surrounded on all sides by sheer cliffs and reachable only by a single narrow track. It was considered to be essentially impregnable, a notion backed up by the fact it had never been captured by military means in more than 200 years since its construction. As far as Hassan was concerned, it was perfect. A stronghold he could defend against an attacking army, even with just a few hundred men. There was one small problem, though. Being smack in the middle of enemy territory, Alamut Castle was already occupied by the very men Hassan was busy hiding from. Taking the castle by force wasn't an option. Despite his successes on the recruitment front, the Nazaris had nowhere near enough men for a frontal assault. That left Hassan in what seemed to be an impossible situation. But, as we're going to find out, he had a bit of a habit of making a mockery of impossible situations, and his solution to this one was incredibly simple. He strolled up to the castle's Seljuk lord and politely explained that he, Hassan, was now in charge. And here's the really crazy part. It actually worked. You see, before Hassan went all peaky blinders and claimed that Alamut Castle was now under new management, he dispatched several of his best men to infiltrate the nearby villages, where they quietly began to convert as many people as they could to the Nazari cause. Over time, some of Hassan's men were able to secure jobs within the castle itself, and eventually Hassan was able to sneak inside disguised as a school teacher. Slowly but surely, more and more people within the castle walls were convinced to switch their allegiance to the Nazari. This plan took the best part of two years to pull off, but by the time Hassan had made his move and revealed his true identity, most of the castle soldiers had already been turned to his cause. The fortress was taken from the disbelieving Seljuk lord without a single drop of blood being spilt. And Hassan not only spared the man's life, he actually sent him on his way with a good chunk of cash as compensation for the loss of his castle. Not that this generosity helped all that much, the Seljuks immediately sent an army to reclaim the fort, but just as Hassan had predicted, he and his men were able to take advantage of its natural bottlenecks to defend it easily, despite being heavily outnumbered. Over the following years, the Nazaris sought out and captured dozens of other strategic strongholds across northern Persia, creating these weird exclaves inside the Seljuk Empire. But the more the Nizari grew, the more attention they attracted from not just the Seljuks, but also from other nearby powers. The Abbasid and Fatimid Caliphates, the Ayyubid Empire, and even Christian Crusaders, who at the time were making regular forays into the Holy Land. Hassan's Nizaris were vastly outnumbered by pretty much all of them, and the threat of attack was constant. Once again, Hassan was left with a seemingly impossible challenge. Namely, how to defend his militarily weak mini-state from the far larger forces of his growing list of enemies. The answer, as you may have guessed, involved the kinds of tactics the Nazari state, which eventually came to be known as the Order of Assassins, is famous for today. Hassan had no hope of threatening the huge armies of his enemies, but what he could do was threaten the men that led them. He began training his bravest, most competent followers in a brand of warfare the world had never seen before. Known as Fadai, 
Hassan's assassins use stealth, disguise, misdirection, and infiltration to directly target enemy military, political, and religious leaders. It was pretty ingenious, really. To attack the Nazari, even with an overwhelming force that was guaranteed victory, was to place a giant target on one's own back. It was asymmetric warfare at its most effective, and with it, the vastly outnumbered Nazari were able to hold their own against a whole range of enemies, who, on paper, were far more powerful. The Fedai had many different ways of eliminating their targets. Often the attacks would be carried out in public. Assassinating an important figure in front of a large audience ensured maximum political and psychological impact. The assassins typically used daggers for the very same reason. The bloodier and more visceral the spectacle, the better. For the most important and therefore well-protected targets, a Fedai might spend months, even years, getting close perhaps even getting a job in the enemy's household or infiltrating their guard detail. For less high-profile individuals, the Fedai would disguise themselves as beggars or mystics, hiding in plain sight as their unwitting mark walked right up to them before striking at the very last second. Not all their attacks were made in public, though. According to one story, when legendary Kurdish general Saladin besieged an assassin stronghold in 1176. He awoke one night in his tent to see a shadowy figure disappearing out the exit. At first, he thought it was one of his guards, until he noticed a poisoned dagger that had been left underneath his pillow. The implication was pretty clear. Bugger off, or next time we'll stick it in your heart. Needless to say, that siege was lifted the very next day and the assassins went on to form a loose alliance with Saladin against Christian crusaders in the Holy Land. Along with their skill, the assassins were also known for their incredible bravery. Many of their assassinations, especially those of the public, up close and personal variety, were pretty much guaranteed to be suicide missions. But the Fedai never wavered. In fact, there are reports that once their task was carried out, they wouldn't even try to defend themselves, and would simply wait for the enemy guards to cut them down. According to some, that bravery came from the use of a drug called hashish, taken so that the assassins could achieve a trance-like focus during a mission. Oddly enough, that alleged drug use is actually the reason we now have the word assassin, which is an anglicized corruption of the Arabic word hashashin, meaning hashish user. The assassin's enemies used the word as an insult. They were basically calling them crackheads. Some historical sources, including Venetian explorer Marco Polo, took the idea of the assassins as drug users one step further, suggesting that opium was an important part of a brainwashing initiation ritual used to inspire absolute obedience amongst new recruits. According to the story, wannabe assassins were dosed up with opium before being taken to a beautiful walled garden inside the fortress of Alamont. This garden was what you might call MTV Cribs worthy, with milk, honey and wine flowing about the place in streams, and scantily clad women singing, dancing, and, well, you can imagine the rest. The recruits would wake the next day after the night of their lives, thinking they'd experienced a vision of paradise. Since the assassins believed this garden of sex, drugs, and rock and milk was where they'd end up if they died, they were more than willing to lay down their lives at the drop of a hat. There are even stories of Nazari assassins proving their unwavering obedience by leaping to their deaths from high places on the orders of their superiors. Apparently, that's where the makers of Assassin's Creed got the idea for their signature leap of faith, which is found in the games. The thing is, it turns out there's no real evidence that the assassins used hashish or any other drugs for brainwashing or for bravery. These stories might be true, 
but they might also be little more than propaganda designed to damage the reputation of the Nazari. That would make sense, since a lot of what we know about the assassins comes from contemporary sources, who either viewed them as enemies, or in the case of people like Marco Polo, as simply mysterious and strange. The Venetian was one of several Westerners who popularised the idea of Hassan Esaba as the Old Man of the Mountain, a moniker that hints at an almost mythical lens through which many people viewed the assassins, even in their own time. But whilst it can be difficult to know where to draw the line between legend and reality, everybody agrees that the assassins' methods were very real and incredibly effective. Hassan forged his followers into an invisible menace, whose shadow loomed large over the Middle East for almost 200 years. They became so feared that it was common for their enemies to wear chainmail under their clothes and surround themselves with guards day and night. Not that it helped all that much. When the assassins set their sights on someone, more often than not, they were as good as dead. In Hassan's time alone, the Order of Assassins are thought to have killed more than 50 high-profile enemy targets. And under the stewardship of the men who took on the mantle of the Old Man of the Mountain after Hassan's death, that number is upwards of 200, with many of those men being world leaders of their day. The numbers are pretty frightening. But their effect allowed the Assassins and their Nizari state not only to survive, but to thrive, spreading out across Persia and eventually Syria, despite being hugely outgunned in almost every department by their many enemies. But all good, well, murdery things must come to an end eventually, and for the Order of Assassins, that end came fairly abruptly, with the arrival of the Mongol Horde that rampaged across Western Asia in the mid 13th century. In the Mongols, the Nazari state had come up against an enemy that was simply too big and too powerful to be intimidated. The Nazaris held more than 50 castles at this point, most of them mountain fortresses. But after some early losses and the capture of their leader, every single one of them was forced to surrender. Alamut Castle was amongst the last to do so in 1256. And with that, the Nizari state was all but finished, though Nizari political influence remained in the region for centuries afterwards. And they never went away entirely. The Nizaris are still going strong today, numbering some 15 million followers. They make up the largest branch of Ismaili Muslims and can be found in more than 25 countries around the world. Needless to say, things have changed a bit a lot since the days of the assassins, but the legacy of those more brutal times lives on. They may have ceased to exist close to a millennium ago, but the Order of Assassins continues to have a remarkable impact on popular culture, and many of the methods they pioneered are still just as relevant today as they were a thousand years ago. Thanks for watching.